<clears throat> so, um, boy, everybody, this is this is a really, really exciting day. Um, if uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to uh, hold on, I got to get my. I'm going to encourage everybody to put their their deep dive nerd hats on um, because we are we're going to be spelunking down a crazy rabbit hole today and uh this is going to just be so much fun our um guest today is dr nina sokolov who not a, doc, not a doctor yet working well, on it. doctor in training that's right so uh so you're a phd candidate at uc berkeley in the boots lab studying cool things everything about bees and um, Nina is studying bee ecology, bee diseases, and bee super spreader events. And, um, and yes, there are bee super spreader events. And, and it's going to be really, 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 really cool. We hope that from today, you're going to come out with, we're going to get a kind of a deeper understanding of bees, and then a little insight into the, the world of bee diseases. And um, boy, it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, our, our hope is that at the end of today, there's a whole bunch of people who are really excited about um, a, 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 about doing a deeper dive into the world of bees. And Nina is going to also have some suggestions about should you want to um, to, to to really dial up your 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 uh, inner being, um, then uh, how to go about that. So um, uh, Dr. Tabi, uh, <laughs> Nita Sokolov, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, first, I just want to send you uh, mad props for having antenna sticking out from either side of your head. Um, this is, this is, this is, you, you've, uh, you, you've got our attention already. I'm going to minimize my screen and turn the floor over to you. Um, and just uh, for, for everybody's interest, as uh, Nina's going along, I'm going to encourage everybody to sketch note this. We can have an opportunity to share some of those sketch notes later. We're going to absorb so much more if we actively sketch note this. And uh, let's write down questions and we can, um, we can uh, uh, have, have a fun uh, B question party. Uh, once, once we've kind of got, um, uh, once once we've done the intro, uh, the introduction to this. If you want to see uh, review these notes later, this whole show is being recorded, and so you'll be able at a time in the future just to go ahead and review the B movie. But here, it's live. Uh, Nina, again, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks so much for, for having me and thanks everyone for taking the time to be here today to learn about bees and their diseases as well as about my research. Um, just like a brief overview and thanks for the lovely introduction. Again, I'm a PhD candidate in the Boots Lab over at UC Berkeley. I'm in my fifth year, so I'm trying to wrap things up. Um, and so today I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit, a little teaser about my research and what I'm thinking of scientifically. Um, and also, I think probably people here that are observing the natural world are really keen and curious to know what are all these different bee species? How can you tell them apart? Um, so I have a little primer on identification stuff and some resources that I've amalgamated for you all to that I use personally. So I think if you if you are curious about um, learning how to identify all these different bees, I've got the, the PDFs for you. Um, and then finally, talking about how I use art in my science, um, especially with entomology, I find that illustration is so key. I'm not, I can't imagine how I'd be able to identify all these different things if I wasn't illustrating them because there are all these teeny tiny differences that by uh, training your observation skills, training your ability to understand what are all these different parts, how do they connect, how am I supposed to, what, what's the this little plate that has a specific number on their bodies and does that have a hair or not, you know? those kind of tiny details that are required for taxonomic identification of these bees to species, artistic skills are so, so helpful in that. Um, so for me, I mean, actually, a lot of people want to know, like, you know, did, did you start, like, did you study bees? Did you love bees your whole life? And that's how you got into this. 
Um, but in reality, no, I um, didn't study bees nor diseases before studying, starting my PhD. And now I've, I'm brimming with information about all those topics because if you study something for five straight years, it's, you're going to learn a lot about it. Um, but I actually first fell in love with insects when I um, did some scientific illustration studying at the Royal Ontario Museum. And actually seeing these insects under the microscope, it just kind of opens you up to this alien world that, that they exist in. And they're just so gorgeous. And um, I fell in love with insects first and then was slowly starting to say, see, I knew I wanted to do research and then fell into the world of bees um, because I'm also interested in their diseases and disease ecology. And so disease ecology is the study of, you know, wanting to know where all these pathogenic organisms are living in an ecosystem, right? Um, and bees are a really good model system for that. So that's the little primer where we're going today. Um, but I, I also want to um, kind of curate, there'll be a Q&A afterwards. So keep, you can put the questions in your chat. I'm happy to be a resource in this space for you all. Um, what I love about bees is that people are genuinely like all really excited about them. So I don't have to like convince you that they're cool by any means. Um, but there's lots to lots of, you know, confusion in the space, actually, like even when I started studying them, there was, I was, you know, confused about certain aspects. And so I will be your guide <laughs> through this confusing insect world. And um, yeah, showing you how how I use my art to better understand them as well. So with that, I made some slides. So how about I share my screen? Okay, can people see that? It's coming. Yes, yes, uh, we, we, we see it very clearly. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, this is, um, some of my art that I do, I use a lot of reference images and everything, um, but I wanna just get right, right to it. I um, am a PhD candidate in the Boots Lab. This is just like, I like, I don't know if people know what zines are, but it's like an amalgamation of different art pieces that people pretty much staple into a booklet. I enjoy creating them. And this is a page from that to describe who I am. I'm a disease ecologist. And so I'm interested in knowing where viruses exist in an ecosystem. And I study how bees get one another sick from sharing flowers. And so first off, yeah, bees can get sick with viruses. Um, pretty much everything can get sick with viruses. Even bacteria can get sick with viruses. Um, those are bacteriophage. Those are um, viruses that infect bacteria. So pretty much everything on Earth can get infected with viruses. And my study system is looking at bees. Um, overall, big grand picture with all this. I'm interested in like, you know, how to do, how to design management strategies to help bees survive into the future. Um, and overall by helping pollinators, we can help um, both agricultural systems be as booming and providing as much food for people as possible, but also helping healthy ecosystems as well. In addition to that, I'm also an artist. Um, here's a few um, pieces of mine. I really like pen and ink um, primarily. Um, I like the control that pen and ink kind of facilitates. Um, but on the top left is a beetle that was done um, with digital illustration as well. Um, I already kind of talked about why I, I mean, I was doodling ever since I was like in middle school, you know, it helps me focus, especially during talks like this. It's impossible for me to pay attention unless I am doodling. Um, much to the chagrin of my high school teachers that thought I wasn't paying attention. And I'm like, no, this is literally how I pay attention. <laughs> if I'm not doodling, I'm probably not listening to you. Um, so I love that there's some of the prompt here is to um, be drawing and, and sketching the ideas. I think that's so important to, to memorization and knowledge and focus, especially on, over Zoom. It's very challenging for me to focus, of course. So I love that you all are doing that. I'm very excited to see your pieces. And yeah, I'm also a disease ecologist in, in training. My lab studies disease ecology, disease evolution. Um, people did COVID mathematical modeling. People do experimental evolution with moths and viruses in the lab to ask questions about disease evolution. So we work all across the board and I'm the, disease, I'm the bee person in the lab. Overall, why am I using bees as a study system? Well, bees are incredibly crucial. And starting in 2006, there was a Save the Bee movement that um, people saw that honeybees were dying at a really fast rate, and it was really concerning. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about the declines, because this is some of the justification behind my work. 
Um, I have a more up-to-date statistic. I need to update the slide, but uh, it's it's similar high losses where during the 2018 winter, an estimated 38% of managed honeybee colonies in the U.S. were lost. Um, so if we lost, you know, almost 40% of any livestock animal in the U.S., it'd be a, it would be a major deal, right? Um, that that is one side of the story. So honeybees are um, non-native to the U.S. They were brought over by European colonizers in the 17th century um, to facilitate the agricultural systems that Europeans wanted. Um, my video just was make sure. Okay. Um, so that's how honeybees got here. So there's no there's no wild there's no like wild honeybees. There are feral honeybees that have left their hives and left a managed situation and established in the wild. So just like feral chickens can establish in the wild or feral pigs, um, they're considered feral because they were managed um, and domesticated originally by humans and then they established in the wild. And so there's honeybee issues, which are a livestock issue, and they experience really high losses and they're severe. Um, but we are able to actually maintain honeybee numbers in the U.S. And if you look at the numbers in the U.S., the honeybee hive numbers are still increasing. Um, and I'm not sure if I have a slide about this later, but the concern is that the increase is not enough to meet the demand um, that we have. Pretty much beekeepers are able to still increase their numbers by taking one strong hive and splitting it into two, requeening it, and from one strong hive, you have two. Um, that's still a lot of labor on beekeepers, and there's still a lot of pressure, um, so it's not sustainable by any means, and there's really high losses, but honey beehive numbers in the U.S. nor worldwide uh, are not going down. They're increasing, but it's just not enough to match how much we like animal-pollinated crops, right? Um, so the wild bee story, so that's the native bee side of things, um, the images that are surrounding me on my Zoom screen, that is a conservation story. So these um, bees have been here for millions of years, co-evolving with the flowers that we see that are also native, um, and those have actual experiences of population declines that are pretty well documented in bumblebees pretty much only. They are considered the charismatic megafauna of the insect world. They're like the pandas. They're cute, they're big, they're fuzzy. People have good collections of them through time. And so we're able to see through time that they are declining, um, at least across a few species. Um, pretty much it's hard to claim that an, like a species is in decline unless you had good data from 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago today, to see that trend line, especially with insect populations. They go up and down and up and down quite a lot for a variety of complicated reasons. But as I said, honeybees are experiencing really high losses. The stuff that we know with bumblebees, they're experiencing high losses. So we don't know how most bees are doing, but since these ones aren't doing very well, we can assume that more species are also not doing well. Um, so Bombus franklini, which is on the top right picture, is the um, kind of pretty much considered the most narrow distribution of any bumblebee species it's on the brink of ex extinction. And the last time that it was found was in 2006. And bee taxonomists are trying, have been trying to go out and look for that thing consistently, and they still haven't been able to find it. But I believe that in order to claim something's extinct, there needs to be a certain time window where you haven't seen it. So we're getting towards there. So that would probably be the first bumblebee species that we documented an extinction of. Um, and then a more local example for the Bay Area is Bombus occidentalis, which is on the bo bottom right. Um, and this has experienced dramatic declines in abundance and range. And this used to be the most common bumblebee species in California, but now we can barely find it in most of California. And overall, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is trying to get listed um, uh, this species along with a handful of other bumblebee species as endangered. But they are experiencing some political um, backlash with that. Uh, overall, a quarter of the 47 species of North American bumblebees are considered under threat. Um, so as I was trying to, this is like a big point I want to highlight for a lot of people because the Save the Bee movement, you know, is very, very good, um, very powerful but it is mostly focused on honeybees thus far. And so honeybees are, you can consider them livestock. They're like chickens and cows. We use them in agriculture in order to, um, um, you know, pollinate crops. They're actually not even able to pollinate all crops because um, they're not specialists. They're pretty much jack of all trades. They're pretty good at 
um, pollinating a lot of things, but not everything. Um, and so they're non-native, um, but they are crucial for crops. And then on the right, we have native bee issues, which are a conservation issue. We have very little data. They are native and therefore they're crucial for native plants. And in addition, they can also help um, increase the sustainability of our agricultural systems by not making us wholeheartedly dependent on any one species. You know, that's always a little sus. Um, but additionally, they are very efficient pollinators. So native bees pollinating certain crops actually increases various agricultural metrics like fruit set or the proportion of flowers that turn into fruit. So two different issues, both not doing well. We can, and I'm interested in solutions that can help out both of them essentially. Um, and with my research, that's kind of big introduction. I'm interested in understanding what are the dynamics of viral spillover between managed and wild bee species. So what viruses are each of them getting? Are they getting one another sick? Who are these viruses naturally circulating in? Are they spilling over from honeybees into native bees? Um, before I had to kind of um, describe more what spillover is, um, but now that we um, experienced COVID, which was a spillover event from a wild animal population into humans, that can happen across the whole gambit. Everybody can get everybody sick, and there's actually really interesting um, uh, examples of a plant virus, the tobacco ring spot virus, that infected plants and then began infecting honeybees and was like kind of a viral speciation event and began infecting and being um, having symptoms in honeybees. So a plant to an animal virus spillover event. I'm like, this is nuts. Why is no one talking about this? <laughs> um, I see a question in the chat of where does Bombus Franklin I live? And that's like Northern Pacific um, Northwest. I need to probably look, I don't think that it's in California, maybe in Oregon or Washington. Um, maybe nor very Northern tip of California. It used to be, people are still looking for it, but it's yeah, in the Pacific Northwest sort of um, area. And with my research, I, as, as Jack was alluding to, there's these super spreader events that can happen um, in all creatures. And that happens in the Central Valley here in California every year for the almonds, which I illustrated this on the top. Every year, 60% of all honeybees in the U.S. concentrate in the Central Valley to pollinate most of the world's almonds. So the Central Valley generates 80% of the world's almonds. Big booming industry. They're wholeheartedly dependent on animals to pollinate them. They also bloom in February where nothing else is out. And so they just need to be totally dependent on beekeepers shipping in their honeybee hives on trucks to get to these orchards where there's this mass mixing event. Um, and from disease theory world, this is exactly a system in which you could evolve more virulent pathogens and just have lots of exposure to different viruses that they're bringing from all across the country. Bees are being migrated from Florida, Idaho, New York, like from, you know, like they're coming from all over and California, of course, to pollinate the world's pretty much the world almonds, right? Um, so I monitor their viruses throughout the bloom. And then subsequently the bees are then, um, after they finish pollinating the almonds, they gotta go somewhere else. And so a lot of beekeepers will then follow the blooms all over the US. Those are migratory honeybee operations. But here in the Bay Area, it's more popular to um, go to the almonds, make your money there, and then you can just stick them on private land for the rest of the year. Um, or go to a couple other crops like citrus in Southern California. And so I want to know, are they being exposed to new viruses during the bloom? Is this a super spreading event? And then once they have those viruses, do they then um, spill over into the native bee community that they interact with once they're moved out of the almonds? Because um, it's not a closed system. Unlike cows and chickens, they're not, they don't have fences. They are willing to fly upwards of 10 kilometers radius around their hives. So the impact of a crop pollination event like this can actually have an impact all um, into the natural areas around them. I, I illustrated this on the right too. I just used it in a poster the other day at a conference and people really enjoyed it. I think I want to make stickers, but um, it shows how um, these virus particles, pretty much a bee that's sick goes and forages on a flower and they shed viruses onto them. They leave and then another bee can come to that flower, consume infectious virus particles, and at some sort of dose that we don't know, they can get sick. Um, also, how long a flower can remain infectious for, got no idea. <laughs> um, yep. 
there's pretty much don't underestimate how little we know in the system. Um, just a few of the viruses that I want to highlight that I study. Um, yeah, and in the chat, that's why all the plant virus spilling over into an animal. Yep. And especially the pollinators, I feel like the more that we look for that, the more we're going to see that it's happened. And where did these viruses come from originally? I think that the plants have totally have something to do with it. It's this consistent interaction. Um, but I think it's wild. And I'm like, how is no one talking about this? <laughs> um, so I study a suite of different viruses. Deformed wing virus um, causes wing deformities in its most pathogenic stage. Um, and reduced life expectancy. This is the one that we're like, for sure, this seems like it came from honeybees originally, but pretty much everything else, we don't know where they came from. Um, Lake Sinai virus, um, it's newly discovered. It's associated with the almonds. We don't know what it does pretty much. Um, sac brood virus, it turns baby bees um, black, um, then they never emerge. And black queen cell virus does the same thing, but um, it does it to the, for honeybees at least, to the to the pupa that are meant destined to be queens. Um, but overall, these are four that I'm focusing on, but there's like around 30. And most of them are RNA viruses. Um, and that, you know, there's lots of different diseases of bees. They can get sick with pretty much anything. Um, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, um, viruses, macroparasites, um, as well. And I study viruses because it's the least studied kind of of them because you can't see them under like most microscopes. Um, because they're RNA viruses, that molecule is very sensitive. And so it'll just break down. And so I have to, I'm like in the field with like a cooler of dry ice that I'm collecting them onto and then like a liquid nitrogen dewer in my car. Because otherwise it can just degrade really rapidly. And because of that, the, you can't use museum samples for that. It's too degraded. You need to collect the fresh stuff. So they're kind of a pain in the butt to work with. And they're the least studied because of that, um, which leaves plenty of, you know, room for discovery for a little old me, you know, but um, definitely they're a challenge. So I work in the almonds one, and then I work in the Sierra and this wildflower system. Um, and why do I do that um, other than it's objectively gorgeous? And actually, I use Jack's um, Sierra Wildflower Guide. Um, so I've been a big fan of his for, for a long time. That has been super helpful in making me familiar with the wildflowers that are up there. Um, so I work just north of Truckee, which is north of Lake Tahoe. Um, there's a UC Berkeley reserve there um, called Sage Hen Creek, um, which is wonderful, a wonderful place to work. And overall, up in the Sierra, there's really high wildflower diversity and bee diversity, which is lovely to study. Um, and at the same time, there's really low honeybee density. In this image, you can see me going towards a yard that is um, roped off by electrical fence, and that's because of bears liking to get into the hives. And so... Beekeeping isn't as popular because nobody likes this $250 at least hive box that they spent being torn apart by a bear. Um, and additionally, the honeybees are not able to survive as feral colonies over those harsh winters. Um, honeybees are originally from the one that we use, at least um, from Europe, the Middle East and North Africa. And so they're not as a uh, um, evolved to the cold climates like bumblebees are, for example. There's really high bumblebee diversity up here. There's like 17 different species of bumblebees. So it's a beautiful place to be a bumble. Um, and what's nice about this system is that because there's really low honeybee density, I can sample these sites before honeybees arrive and then after honeybees arrive to see what's the viral community in the bumblebees and the other native bees before honeybee arrival. So like what's just circulating in them without honeybees? Um, cause that's kind of a rare data set to have. And then once honeybees come and are migrated here by these beekeepers that I work with, do they bring viruses with them? And then do you see spillover? And if so, how fast? Um, here's a sampling scheme. I sampled the, this, this, um, beekeeper stuff through the almonds. Then after the almonds, they go to a stopover site. Um, then I sample the bumblebee community before honeybees arrive and then subsequently after honeybees arrive at several time points throughout the summer. Um, this temporal data or this data through time is really helpful to understand dynamics specifically. And a lot of work so far just looks at a single time point. And so you can't really, um, um, you can't really um, understand who's giving viruses to who if it's just one time point and they both have it. You're like, well, I don't know who gave that to who. Um, and 
yeah, no SEMA. I see Jack asked in the chat. That is a, a fungal, is a like microsporidian pathogen. So it's not in my wheelhouse. It's just, yeah, it causes diarrhea and bees. Um, but you can see it under the microscope. So I'm always jealous of my colleagues that work on that because I'm like, oh, you can just take out those guts and put them under a slide and see them. That must be nice instead of having to slave away in the or work hard in the in the lab space for you know six hours in order to even understand what's there. Um, um, yeah, okay, I'll keep looking at the chat, but I want to make sure to get through this. Um, so yeah, this temporal data set is really, really helpful um, to be able to understand dynamics of these viruses, and working in the Sierra is objectively very lovely as well. Um, and very excitingly, too, that Bombus occidentalis um, endangered bumblebee that I was talking about at the beginning, the Western bumblebee, I have found it across several of these sites. And so I've been working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to inform them that they're here. Um, and I'm working with an undergrad um, for their honors project to keep finding them and um, non-lethally um, catch them, take the pollen off of them and see what they're feeding on. Um, Cause if we can see what they're preferring with the flowers, then maybe we can help steward the land to make sure those flowers are protected um, to make sure the bee is doing as, as good as possible. But it's looking like this population is some of the most Southern reaches that, um, of the species that are being found in California still. Um, so that's exciting, but sad, but you know, I'm very happy to be finding them there and that the populations are doing pretty well. Um, pretty much, it seems like most of them have moved up into the Pacific Northwest, and there's some still in Colorado, but in California, they're just not doing too hot. So that's two field systems. I have a third field system that I developed all by myself. And during the pandemic, like I said, I've doing, been doing this for five years. And during the pandemic, the lab work didn't happen very much because doing this stuff in isolation is both bad for the brain and also unsafe um, to work in the lab in isolation. So I've been doing a lot of field work. It's all local, which I'm very lucky um, for. The Sierra stuff is a three and a half hour drive. The Marin County stuff is just an hour, an hour and a half, which facilitates me being able to go and sample, get to know these communities um, and really understand um, them through time. So I also work in Marin County, which is just north of the Bay Area, um, north of San Francisco. And there there's um People love bees up there, so they're, I, I collaborate a lot with people that are like, yeah, I have honeybees, um, come on to my land and everything, um, which I'm very thankful for. And here, here's like a map of all the different spots um, that I have. Maybe I have a few more at this point, but you can see it's a good spread across Marin County. Um, and here I'm interested in understanding questions about honeybee management. And so... I sample honeybees that are different in management style. I look at feral honeybees, so ones that are just like in a barn or in a tree, you know, um, and have just been existing without without human um, interventions of any kind for at least a year. Um, but one of the sites has even had a feral hive going for nine years. Um, and then I also sample the bumblebees that they interact with through time. And then I also look at commercial hives, so these migratory operations that go to the almonds and then later get placed onto these cattle ranches for pretty much the rest of the year. And so I also sample them and the bumblebees that they interact with through time. Um, recently, I've also added into this, but I don't have a slide about it, is that I'm comparing them kind of an intermediate zone is... Um, uh, managed honeybees, so people are taking care of them actively, but they don't migrate. So they're just static. They're people's backyard bees, hobbyist bees, um, and uh, honey producers and things like that. So kind of like a little bit of a gradient of management style. So I'm sampling all of those bees off the flowers and from their hives and the bumblebees that they're interacting with to, to ask these kind of questions about are any one of these management styles better or worse for disease spillover? So that is the, the spiel about my research, my dissertation effectively. Um, and I'll pause there to, to have people ask any questions about the research aspect before going into the little primer about how to identify bees. I see a comment from Susan that says, help, I was abducted by aliens who did science experiments on me. What did they do to you? They stole my all my pollen. I, especially like being in the pandemic, just in isolation and just like losing your mind in the field, I totally think about how like strange of an entity I am to the bees, especially when I like, they, I don't get them into the tube and they fly away. And I'm like, the stories that they'll tell. 
to their um their hive mates and no one believes them because they just oh i had this alien abduction story so i don't i'm right there with you susan i'm thinking the same thing um but, no. oh, uh, nina this is a uh, uh, jack again um mm -hmm. I, I something that i'm i'm seeing here i want people just to as we're listening just sort of pay attention to the thought with of that's kind of into the structure of these these experiments um you know looking at the honeybees before the bumblebees before the honeybees and bumblebees when they're together um the this is how we use the tool of science to figure cool stuff out and i think that this is just such a wonderful example of scientific thinking and how we can start to figure out these puzzles based on evidence this is really cool yeah yeah thank you i appreciate that i think it's cool <laughs> it's just like i didn't know what i wanted to study even before like starting my phd but then this all like kind of fell into my lap and i'm like oh no this is it like this is so cool for me um yeah i see that taking into account so many variables and how to observe each of the field biology chaos it's chaos out there um but i always say that if i can detect a signal amongst all the chaos amongst all the variables then that must be pretty strong but i'm also always envious of the empiricists that work in the lab that can just change one variable and see how that changes things um versus here there's lots of things that are different but there's very little survey data and there's very little understanding of how common is spillover really and just basic questions of which species have what who's giving what to who you know that like basic biology basic virology is just now starting to come up and um, be understood and everything so um it is very fun for me at least it's a my job description is going out and gallivanting in wildflower meadows you know um I also see one question from Susan of why are so many of the world's almonds grown in the Central Valley they can't possibly be the only place in the world with the right conditions to grow almonds um that's correct I know that they're Mediterranean in origin as well um so I know that most likely Greece <laughs> will grow almonds too but I think geographically much smaller country and everything but I actually don't know what the the history is there I know that California is unique in its lat lounge you know like in its Mediterranean climate as well um so I wonder if they are kind of limited but they're blooming in February like I said which is very strange like that's there's no native bees out yet even if we wanted them to be pollinated by native bees um so I do wonder if there's other places in the world that could grow them I know that the Central Valley is literally sinking because of how much water they take I think and since I feel ah, I'm not gonna totally say a statistic because I feel like I'm bad at remembering numbers but since the 40s like there's been maybe like a 20 foot drop in the in the literal ground because of the overtapping of the groundwater sources there um okay I feel like that's all the questions uh -huh. yes so and I just want to encourage people as we're going along um drop a uh questions into the chat as we're moving along and the um and uh, Nina won't necessarily interrupt herself in the middle of things, but everyone so will be coming back to check on these questions. So your question doesn't get lost. Uh, you can drop it into the chat. Uh, yeah, and if I somehow don't see it, I'm um, just copy and paste that thing right back in. I'm I'm looking through. I want I want this to be. Ooh, thank you for sharing that, Marcia. Um, I want this to be definitely a um, you all using me as a resource. That's what I think my <laughs> what I my responsibility is as a scientist. So please, I love hearing your questions, and maybe I don't know all the things. And this is also like a great way for me to study. I'm like I should study the history of almonds. Like if there's such a central point, like I want to know more about them. So thank you for for sharing. It's like a, I love the the back and forth exchange of knowledge. Um, so with that, um, some primers for folks that are interested in um, being able to identify bees truly. Um, I guess I'll just pop this into the chat. Um, I, I naturalist is the best, you know, like you can post for those that don't know, it's a um, free web-based resource that is, was developed by the California Academy of Sciences in order for you to be able to take a picture, upload it, 
And then the community of scientists will, and also peers um, who are confident in identification will be able to come through and help you identify. And it gives, there's like some algorithm, some probably machine learning sort of stuff that gives you a best guess of what you think that the species is based on the area and what was known before and what it looks like. Um, but then people, community, the hive mind, if you will, comes in and helps you identify them as well. So wholeheartedly recommend that as a resource if you're into taking photographs of insects. And that is really helpful for scientists too. This is a community science endeavor in which you can help with um, people understanding where are different species and um, kind of uh, the, the seasonality of them as well as their location, their spread. So not only is it helpful for you to learn what these things are, and you have like little checklists and everything that you um, can keep track of what you've been finding, but also you are helping science endeavors. And I know scientists that use, and there's now been a bit big push in the scientific community, even at the last conference I was at, that people are saying we should use this rich depository of, of data um, for scientific um, research. So highly recommend using them. Um, but to um, for your own skills, um, here I want to show the differences between like bees and flies, bees and wasps, and then different groups of bees. I'm just kind of rapid fire because I also want to get to the art and leave plenty of time for the Q&A. Um, so here on the left, you see a honeybee, and here on the right, you see a, a bee mimicking fly. And um, actually, can you see my pointer? Like my... my um, Cursor, yes. rather? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so here's some major differences. Sometimes the flies, I mean, the flies certainly fool my undergrads when they're out there helping me. It happens, but I've even been fooled just the other day. So sometimes they can be really good. Um, big difference is that honeybees have, I mean, all bees have two pairs of wings. So here's one pair. Here's a second pair of wings. It's kind of when they're on the flowers, hard to see, but um, versus flies have just a singular pair of wings. Um, also at rest, I find that bees are more likely to fold their little wings across their back versus flies kind of keep them out like little airplane arms. Um, for me, the biggest um, thing that I can notice quickly is you can see this difference in antennal length. So bees will always have nice long antenna versus flies got little stubby little things. Um, so if I see stubby little antenna, I'm like, you're a fly. Um, and same thing with their eyes. Um, bees have like, this is kind of a dark image, sorry about that, but bees have like smaller, like little cat eyes across their heads versus flies have really big kind of bulbous eyes that almost connect on the top of their head. There's some male bees that they kind of look like that as well. So that one's less overall indicative, but the short, short antenna and the one pair of wings is, um, um yeah and also there's a comment that says bees latch their wings together in flight so it's yeah it is definitely hard to tell um yes yes exactly bees two pairs of wings longer antenna and very different eyes um also this if you see a bee an insect that is carrying big old pollen pants like that is a bee for sure not all bees do that <laughs> So it's not like a for sure thing, but if you're seeing them covered in like big amounts of pollen, that is a bee thing for sure. Um, bees versus wasps. This is a little bit of a confusing statement because actually bees are wasps. They are, you know, if we think of like phylogenetic trees or like seeing how these different species are related. I even thought that it was like bees are here and wasps are here and they're like sister related to one another. But in reality, wasps are here and bees are within the family of, of wasps. So they're a type of wasp. Confusing. Um, they're a vegetarian wasp. Um, but the annoying actual difference between them is that somewhere on a bee's body, there are hairs that are branched. So a hair like this, and then there's like little branches that come, like little other hairs that come off of it. Not all over the body. Somewhere on the body. <laughs> Um, but that's technically the major difference. Um, but then the, you know, more pragmatic differences are that, uh, wasps have this really thin waist a lot of the time. And to me, like wasps just like look meaner a lot. So that, that's like a terrible like description, you know, like, um, a lot of there's parasitic bees that are kind of hairless and kind of can look like wasps quite a bit, but I just find that their faces are still like 
kind of cute, you know, like in comparison to wasps kind of look pretty, pretty mean, but overall it's the really, really thin waist that I find can, can help you with that. Um, because even the parasitic bees, they don't, uh, they don't carry pollen on them and they don't have many hairs. So that's where it can get a little dicey with the parasitic ones. Um, and when I say parasitic, I, um, mean that just, I'm not sure if people are familiar with cuckoo birds, but cuckoo birds are birds that don't rear their own eggs. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds and then their babies hatch first, pick out the other babies and make the other species raise them. And that's pretty much fish do that as well. And so these parasitic bees also do that. So they lay their eggs in the nests of other bees. And even for this event, um, the picture that I chose for the description of the event, that was actually a parasitic bee, um, a little Easter egg, um, but they look kind of like villainous. They're like black and white and red often. They kind of look waspy, but I think that they're really cool. Um, so overall, hair, bees have are fuzzier most of the time, um, have these branched hairs, and then wasps are meaner looking and have a thin waist. Um, but those can be tricky a lot of the times. Um, this is a slide that I feel like I feel like we should just keep going, and I'm totally good to share to share these slides. This isn't even my resource, um, so I can share this with others. And then within bees, there's um, major families that you will see represented around here. Um, apidae, so apid bees are the honeybees, the bumblebees, digger bees, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, Andrinidae is the mi these mining bees. Um, Calididae is are these like cellophane bees, which they're called cellophane bees because they like produce their own kind of like plastic cellophane like substance that they line their brood cells with. Really weird. Um, Helictidae are sweat bees and Megachylidae are mason bees. Mason meaning they like to use mud and kind of the, the easy thing there with any megachylid is that if you see a bee packing pollen on their bellies, they even kind of like stick their little abdomens up and they're packing their pollen on the underside of them. So they can, you can see like bright orange, you know, pollen on their bellies. Those are always going to be megachylids um, somewhere in that family versus helictids, and apids, and andrenids. They all collect those big pollen pants. Um, and calidids, the cellophane bees, they actually collect their pollen internally in a little crop like a bird. Um, so you won't see them, like I said, not all bees, you'll see them carrying pollen on the outside. Um, male bees don't collect pollen like that. Um, but uh, if you ever do see a bee with these thick, thick pollen pants, like if you, it, an insect, then it is a bee. Um, but there's other bees that don't do that. So there's in biology, there's always rules. And then here's all these examples of things that don't follow that rule, which I personally enjoy. Um, but it does make it confusing, of course. Um, I see that Susan says, do all bees collect pollen intentionally as opposed to just nectar? Oh, yeah, that's a complicated question. I mean, the social bees like honeybees, there's like pollen collectors and then there's nectar collectors. So it depends. And also um, that can change throughout the life of a bee, what they need nutritionally changes depending on what they're trying to do. Um, pollen is a protein source. And so there's some idea that insects upregulate their protein intake. So their pollen intake in this case when they're sick. Um, because protein is the substrate for immunological responses. Um, so that's like a way that you can help um, bees fight off infections is by giving like nice, delicious, pro pollen rich plants um, in your gardens and stuff like that. Um, so pretty much uh, bees definitely collect pollen intentionally. Some are more picky in what pollen that is. Some are specialists versus others are generalists. And then um, male bees just eat pollen like they're not collecting anything for their babies um they're just you know doing male insect things of mating with the females when they emerge and then nothing else and just feeding themselves so um not all bees are collecting this pollen neither are kleptoparasitic bees they're just eating it for themselves um so here if you ever see in the bay like a silvery kind of medium-sized body zoom in really fast bee it's a anthophora a bigger bee um, so these are related to honeybees and bumblebees, but they're solitary. So they're 
large, fast, zooming, thick bodied, um, bright silver. And the most common one that we see around here is Anthophora urbana. Um, but uh, iNaturalist definitely will help you with that. This, if you're into bumblebees, this guide, and I'll, once we're done with this conversation, I will um, share a bunch of the links to these things. This guide is so good. The bumblebees of the Western US, um, they kind of break down all these different terms that people use when identifying things. But as you can see here on the left, already drawing these things is super helpful because they're all these tiny different um, um, pieces, I guess, little like we're putting names to them in order to say like on, especially these, uh, this, these T's, these are all called turgle um, segments or turga for individual ones. And depending on the color of each of them, that helps you um, identify them to species. Um, so knowing these little bits, but I just like, you memorize it after being de dealing with them for so long, but often I'll just like have a printed out image, like just stuck right next to my microscope in order to help. This one is like the most kind of tricky of um, if you're like actually like thoroughly wanting to get at these identifications. Bumblebees have different cheek lengths because they have different tongue lengths for co-evolution of different flowers and everything. And so this was the part that I like had to really stare at them for a long time because it's kind of the ratio of the length shorter than the width or the length equaling the width. This one's this is the hard mode for sure, but it just takes with any of these like nature journaling stories, right? It's like this art of observation. So just staring at so many little faces for so long and eventually you're like, ah, yes, that is a long face, long cheeked bee. Um, and so the guide looks a little bit like this for all these West Western bumblebee species, but there's different guides for different regions, of course. Um, Bombus falsensensicii is the most common bee that you'll see in the Bay Area. It's uh, got a lot of black on it um, with just a little bit of yellow um, on its abdomen, little yellow shoulders and a yellow face. It's also called uh, the yellow-faced bumblebee, but in this guide, they tell you what plants they like, the tongue length, where they're found, who they're most likely to be confused with, which is helpful because <laughs> you're like, they kind of can all, they can definitely look a lot alike. And then their phenology or the timing of when they're out throughout the year. So that's also really helpful. Um, and um, this is kind of what this, the identification guide looks like. They break it down into these different little pieces. And so that's T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. And so it's T4 um, is yellow versus a lot of them um, are black. And then the little yellow face and the little yellow shoulders. So these guides, I also just have printed out and um, uh, pretty much use them as comparison when I'm trying to identify stuff. But it uh, takes a lot of practice. <laughs> Um, Melisodes, I think I'm just gonna go quickly through this last bit of stuff because I this is all from a document that I can just share um, for people that are particularly keen about this. Um, but they're called the longhorn bees. They're some of my favorite because look at them, look at those long antenna. They're so ridiculous. <laughs> um, so the males have these ridiculously long antennas that are super cute. Um, my favorite party trick is that I can tell of certain species which one, which bees are male. And so I'll just like grab them off a flower because male bees can't sting. Um, so I'm just like, if I'm trying to show off, I'll just like grab a bee out of the air, <laughs> like the carpenter bees or something, which are particularly large and dopey. Um, and yeah, they just, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's cool. Maybe it just depends on the, the um, crowd that you're in, <laughs> of course. But yeah, the stinger is a modified ovipositor, which is the thing that they lay their eggs through. And so males don't have that. And so male bees, no male bees will ever sting you. They could try to bite you, but I've, I've personally never been bitten, even though I'm grabbing them all the time. <laughs> um, so here is one of those parasitic bees I was mentioning, Nomada. Looks very wasp-like, am I right? Um, they can even come in these yellow colors, which are, this is when I'm just like, man, you know, this is getting challenging. But if you ever see kind of a bright red bee in your gardens, that's a nomada um, for sure. But then these ones, again, is it wasp? Is it is it a bee? You got to look at those. You got to look at that face. Is it mean looking or is it still kind of cute? You know, um, that's literally like how I do it. Because And then I look, if I really need to figure it out, I'll look for those hairs in their body. But you have to have a microscope for that. Um, I'm just giving you like the, like there's le legit ways to do this. And then there's like, you're in the field and it's on the wing and you're like, okay, do you have a sweet face or not? Um, 
This is Hylaeus. I think that they're super cute. Um, they um, are quite small. They're called the masked bees because they have these little yellow masks on their faces and on their um, kind of their joints, they have these kind of like pinstriped legs as well. So you'll find these. Um, these are a type of sweat bee in that Helictidae family. Um, metallic green, beautiful. Um, they can also experience uh, sexual dimorphism, so the males look different than the females. So on the right, the pure green ones, that's the female, versus here on the left, the green with the bl black and yellow abdomen, that's a male. Um, they're called sweat bees because they do like to lick up your sweat. Um, I've been stung by them, but just because you, they like to like hang out on like the back of your knee or something, so they're licking up your sweat, and if you like squish them, they'll, they'll you know, be upset about it, um, which is, I find, fair and reasonable, but... Honeybees are the only ones that their stinger, when they sting you, it gets ripped out. Um, all other bees can, and wasps too, can sting multiple times. And they're not um, putting as much venom in you when they do that. Um, so normally people don't have almost any reaction to that. Laceoglossum is like one of those things that you would, these are a different type of sweat bean. If you see something that's like teeny tiny in a flower and they're black and you're like, is that a wasp? And you see them with their little pollen pants on. It, it could very well be a lacial glossum. As you can see on the bottom image, she's still collecting pollen onto her pants. Um, and so these ones are very hard to identify as species, but if you see tiny little black bees in a flower, very well could be that. And then with megachylae, um, they are a type of leaf cutter bee. Um, so they're the ones in that megachylid family. So in your garden on the right image, if you see these like little crescent moons, these little half moon lights taken out, um, of your leaves that suggests that um, there's a leaf cutting bee in your midst. Um, and so the top right picture of the bee that shows a female, she's taking a, that little leaf um, back to her nest and they line their, their nest cavities in these leaves. Um, and there's some amount of uh, speculation that they have antimicrobial properties, antifungal properties. They maintain a good humidity in their, in their nest cells and everything. And so that's why why they do it. And the bottom right picture, you can see that bright yellow um, pollen. So instead of collecting them on their pants, um, they collect it on their little bellies. Um, so that's indicative of this family. And these megachylid bees, they got really fuzzy bellies. Um, so that's super cute. Um, what counts as cute? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not, um, I'm not saying it's a good <laughs> description. Um, you got to just stare at enough of them. And be like, okay, you do look a little meaner. <laughs> like you look like you would want to sting me versus like you still look like a sweet little baby, little baby bee. But that doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not legit. Um, I'm just giving you the, the legit, like the real things that I'm doing in the field, even if they're, and then I can scientifically, you know, um, validate them afterwards. Um, are they the ones that do the pollen butt dance? Yeah. So if you ever see like the bees that are like sticking their little bums in the air, um, and that's because they're like trying to pack um, pretty efficiently. Indeed, they are. Um, and then, yeah, I've read that leafcutter ants raise fungus or aphids. Um, yeah, leafcutter bees are not doing that. Yeah, that's correct. Um, leafcutter ants are cutting leaves in order to feed the fungus in their colonies because that's what they're eating. They're not eating the leaves, they're eating the fungus. Um, so that's a really cool um, coevolution story. But these ones are using the leaves instead to just line their brood nest cells. They're not, I mean, who knows how they're actually interacting with the microbes that are in there for sure, but they're not rearing that for food for themselves. They're collecting food um, for their babies and that's what they're doing on the, on the flowers. And then Andrenids, they're kind of like in script in my op op opinion. <laughs> um, if you ever see a bee with just like a glorious facial mustache, it's an Andrenid. So in the bot, like over here on, on the right side, the facial foveae is the real word for that, not a glorious mustache, but um, they have really, really fuzzy faces um, like that. And at rest, they're kind of abdomens, like uh, how to like say this is the thorax and this is the abdomen. A lot of bees are kind of like at horizontal, but andrenas kind of like keep their um, abdomen a little bit more flat. Um, and especially when you pin them, they look like that. So that is a major primer through um, a lot of bee identification stuff, but it really just takes staring at them, you know, for an extended period of time. Yeah, is there an advantage to being iridescent green? I I mean, like, I think they're much, like, I, I would say I'm like, yeah, they're on green background. So maybe that's like a confusing thing from predators looking top down, but then like 
why are only the sweat bees metallic green like that you know the color side of things I am not well versed in of like why are these different bees different colors like this by any means but I've always been curious about that as well the one on the lower left yeah though that's what I'm saying big old pollen pants <laughs> If you see something with big old pollen pants like that to the point that you're like, are you even able to fly? It's a bee. <laughs> um, yeah, and how they look to each other. Don't If you're interested in thinking about how do animals uh, go through the world and how different that is from how we experience the world, um, there's a really wonderful book that just came out by Ed Young. Um, oh, what is it called? Mm. I'll look it up, but it's like all talking about the visual systems of different organisms, including bees, which see like mostly in UV um, spectrums of light. So they're seeing the world in a very different way. Um, and bees, most common predators, those are spiders, those are wasps. There's literally a wasp called the bee wolf. Um, there's crabs. If you've ever seen crab spiders on your flowers, these white spiders, they're just like waiting for pollinators to come by. Um, birds will eat them too. So yeah, it's definitely, it's hard out there um, being being a bee for sure. Um, yeah, and so about bee nest, I heard that we should make bee motels um, and that we, yeah, to help the native or solitary bees, but that you also need to clean them or that we could create disease grounds. Yes, exactly. Um, so people, I, whenever people try to say that like the solution to this environmental problem is through buying my product you know like I'm always like Ugh. you know I'm I'm much more of the opinion that I'm like if you create the natural environment that they would be needing by providing just sticks or providing logs or like providing like what they're looking for anyway then they'll kind of like figure it out um because yeah if you if a lot of the bee motel stuff and specifically um katie lacroix who is um a pro postdoc in cornell she works on osmia mining bees and these bee hotels and she's seeing that like yeah they are they can be full of disease so like i would definitely be um careful if you are wanting to get something for that but i'm of, of the idea that i'm like if you if you just build the environment that they would normally have they'll they'll figure it out you know what i mean but having nesting, when you're designing your garden, having nesting sites available for bees is really important. It's not just about foraging. It's not just about the flowers. It's also about they need the nests um, to be able to have the next generation um, be growing. And so most bees are ground nesters, 80% or so. So having bare soil, um, sandy soil, clay soil, like all these different types of soil substrates, different bees like different substrates. And not just like covering it in mulch or anything is really helpful um, for them for sure. Um, there we go. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Um, so with that, I'm sure more bee questions will come percolating in, but I just want to make sure we're chugging through. Um, the last little bit is just me talking about my art and how I use art. Um, so I am considered, I'm a scientist, but I'm also an artist. Um, I do this for outreach events, including through the Lawrence Hall of Science, um, where we collaborate a lot together with the Science at Cal events. Um, and with that, I made these native bee coloring book pages that are for kids and adults that like to color, you know. Um, and I've actually up, I've updated them recently. So if anyone's uh, interested, there's a more up-to-date version of, of this that I give out to teachers as a resource to just, you can print them out. Pretty much the idea is that I want people to become um, more aware of the diversity of bees um, in their area and everything. Um, so I've been slowly making more and more of these to, to accomplish that. And they're like an easy thing to give out uh, outreach events as like a free little prize and everything. Um, this started off from the Bay Area Science Festival Be Colorful event that I did, where kids during the pandemic got to color these things in at home or draw them alongside me. Um, and as I was mentioning before, I first fell in love with insects at the Royal Ontario Museum, where I began working under a PhD candidate who was um, illustrating praying mantises for his dissertation. And so he, like, Getting to that age, like when you're in science, people are often like, well, you're like such a good artist and like nobody criticizes you. Um, but instead he was criticizing me and it was a really good training. He was like, is that patch of hairs there? Mm -hmm. No, then why is it there? <laughs> and I was like, oh God, but it really like super helpful training. So here on the left, we have not a bee, but a fly. Look at those stubby little antenna and big eyes. 
Um, this is a hoverfly, um, Chrysotoxin flaviferens. And here's my, it's not, that wasn't what image I was using, um, but that is the species that I was looking at. And um, if people are interested in scientific illustration questions, I can discuss more about that. But I did it like old school way with this and it took like weeks, you know. Um, I have a lot of reverence for anyone that is a scientific illustrator in their career because it doesn't just have to be beautiful, it has to be accurate. Um, and that is not easy. <laughs> it is studying, like it is not just art, it is a study. Um, here is, uh, this is actually a specimen I was using. This is an ant mimicking tree hopper. Um, in the membracid family, this is a in the tropics. Um, it's like very hard to understand what's happening here, right? Um, but imagine a cicada's body. So here's its eyes, here's its legs. And then this is a projection off of pretty much the back of its thorax that looks like an ant from above. But they're like these like teeny tiny little creatures. So again, I'm like, aliens are amongst us. Like these are gorgeous. And so here was my um, pen and ink illustration of that ant mimicking tree popper. I have to put the image next to it because when I just show this thing, people are like, literally, what am I looking at? Um, this is actually, it was very uh, serendipitous. One of my friends commissioned me before I even started my PhD to do the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, which is um, uh, the first ever bee to be listed as endangered by the federal government in the U.S., in the continental U.S. Um, so I illustrated that from him um, using some collections as well. So I go into museums and I look specifically from... Um, collections, uh, pinned species, pinned individuals under a microscope. And um, yeah, rather than a lot of times nowadays, I'm like looking off of photographs and everything. So yeah, there's the rusty patch. Um, this is a squash bee that I illustrated. This is Pepinapis. Um, got these, you see this really long tongue coming out. Their tongues are crazy. Um, and also have some species identification at the tongue level, which gets really crazy. Um, yeah, so here's an illustrated image of what that looked like. This well, uh, is digital. Hey, this, is, this is Jack again. Um, as we're looking at these, I want people to really pay attention to a couple of things here. One, the way you are handling fuzzy versus non-fuzzy zones is really, really nicely handled. And in your fuzzy zones, um, where you, like when you're looking at the back of that bumblebee, um, where you have sort of one side, the, 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 the sort of the hair direction. Um, sort of notice that what happens sort of when these hairs come together, it's easy to draw them when you're sort of looking at sort of the sides of the hair. But look in the thorax there in that sort of central zone, that little area in there is really critical to making this work. And this is just handled wonderfully. Um, so everybody sort of right up the middle of the thorax, notice how Nina is, um, wrangling, yeah, right in there. The the direction change in that fuzzy. Mm. The other thing I want you to take a look at is what is she doing with the transparency of the wing? You still are very clear that there's body and and leg down there, but look at how what is happening, how the leg is handled when you're looking through the wing when you're looking, um, when you're not looking through the wing. Also, the next one shows that really well as well. Look at the transparency there in the body and how the, the suggestion of fuzzy. Ooh, th these are, these are wonderful illustrations. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the fuzzy texture is not, not easy. And especially what's, what's nice, um, about this is digital you can you can erase you can erase some of the stuff to give this like white line to it um when i was doing it traditionally let's see if i can find an example yeah so over here i like was taking it was like a weird type of paper and i was taking a pin and i was like scratching away the ink to kind of give like depth with it but the hairs making things look fuzzy is uh non-trivial so thank you was, for this, was that on scratch board it, I, it was like kind of like like see-through plasticky stuff. Oh, uh, like durly. Yeah. Something. Yeah. It's uh, it was a very weird um, texture, but very cool to. It was because like I was doing like layers and layers of different um, drawings because like these like things look really perfect, but the specimen is like you know curled up and everything. So you'd do like one leg in one plane, and that's like on one piece of transparent paper, and then you like stack them all, and then overlay it on this thing that's like hardy plasticky paper 
that is still transparent, but has um, some good weight to it. So it's, yeah, it's, it was very legit and very challenging over time. And then this is more just uh, sketching like a praying mantis on the left. And uh, this is a, a leaf footed bug. It's a hemipteran that like is a pest on papaya, but I just think that they've got beautiful big legs. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a side of a crane fly. So those like big people call them like mosquito eaters or whatever, but the, this was like a study of stippling of like how to, how to show like these like curves and um, kind of convex and concave um, textures of their thorax um, as well as their weird little necks and everything, but their legs pop off like nobody's business. So I didn't illustrate the legs, um, but yeah, a lot of stippling and um, a lot of hours staring at these weirdos under a microscope. I like colored pencil as well for that. Like I said, this controlled element, um, botanical illustration is very helpful as well, but both of these were just um, gifts for my family. <laughs> um, but colored pencil is a very beautiful tool. These were um, uh, illustrations, digital and a watercolor illustration of a beetle that I worked on in undergrad. Um, and yeah, some digital illustration examples. Here's like a paramiscus, this is like, yeah, paramiscus mouse that I worked on as well as some like studies of a red panda, just because I think that they're very cute. This was a, I, I use also my art in um, scientific papers. This is like a graphical abstract for a paper that we're about to submit um, to a journal about the evolution of varroa mite resistance. So there's these mites that vector viruses to honeybees. And um, the worse the mites are on the bees, we argue the worse that the viruses will be for the native bees that they're interacting with. Um, and I also have this, in, I call it industrial naturalism in which I like take a silhouette and um, this is more like for fun. Like, and so this is more of the expression, having a nice time. Cause all those are like studies, they're you know, take a lot of brain power. But this stuff is more of like my creative side that I just wanted to highlight for a second, where I sketch out in pencil the um, outline of different organisms, and then I kind of like fill it in with my brain, <laughs> I don't know, musings. Um, so seahorses um, are pretty inspiring to me, like that was a sea dragon back there. Um, this is a bull that's done in this. This is the first time that I experimented with this style. Um, using kind of like the idea of like human made materials, these like steel plates and wires and everything to illustrate the silhouettes, um, a crane in the same sort of style, dragonfly. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to also show that this is like when I have fun <laughs> and just like want to relax and kind of um, have a nice time with it. And so I'm using art across all these different now that I've, say, I've walked around with Jack as well and seen how, how wonderful nature journaling is. I'm excited to add that layer into my repertoire because um, it's just so also healing and stuff to be out in nature and just slowing down and sitting down. And I thought it was going to be like pure science and it was going to be like another study. And I'm like, I'm so tired, but I'm like, wait, no, this is actually like incredibly relaxing and makes me appreciate the moments around me. So I'm excited to add that as a layer of things that I do too. Um, but I hope that you can see with all of that, that my art is very um, complementary to the science that I do. And I, I feel um, very supported in that, like my PI and um, people at conferences, they're all like very like, wow, this, this is great. Um, so I feel lucky that people aren't like, ooh, be more of a scientist, you know, I think that that used to be a, a bit more of a style, even though art was such a major component in the history of science. Um, but I see that there's a bit of a revival there. And for me, it's really helpful for observation of the natural world, um, as well as communicating with people. It's so much more engaging to look at a poster or a presentation that has art or illustration. So people that might not be able to intake all the words that I'm blabbering on about, they'll still be able to look at that image and be like, got it, you know? So with that, um, I will, this is my email. Got any questions about bees? <laughs> I am your gal, um, especially in the Bay Area, if you have honeybees. Um, I'd love to talk about them as well. Um, and so then uh, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Oh, boy. This uh, first, um, uh, I'm going to encourage you just to bounce over to the gallery view for a minute. Everybody um, uh, pop on your camera and let's give Nina some love. Um, this is, is, is amazing, amazing. The way you are combining art um, conservation, passionate um, love, and just sort of joy and, and, and delight in these species with a scientific rigor. Um, this is, this is well, just what a great mindset. 
thank you so much for for this the, this presentation. It's just it's so powerful just to kind of get a little bit inside your brain, and and sort of see. I it, it would be fun to kind of travel around inside your neurons for a little bit and kind of look out and and see just how nuanced and complex and and I can feel the play. I can feel the 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 science. This is this is really really exciting. Um, so if you have a question, if you have a question for, for, for Nina, you can either use the raise hand function or you can um, just raise your hand and, and turn on your camera and, and wave at me and we'll be kind of looking for you um, to, 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 to do such things. The, um, oh, oh are, are, you, are, are the um, links that you're putting in there right now, are those the... Uh, Those are the but, guides. One of them is the Western Bumblebee guide, and the other one was like more of like a general bee guide that had like a lot more information than even what I showed. So it's um, very helpful. And also, if anyone's interested in the native bee coloring book pages, I need to get just like them on my website or something. But I have a PDF stitched together of all of them, and I will share that with anybody who wants them. Anybody who knows any teachers that need like a pollinator, you know, activity for their science class for a day. Um, yeah, so please email me. Um, and I think my email was dropped into the chat. I will share that broadly. Excellent, excellent. So are there two links that you've put up there? Yeah, or... so the first first one, the extension Colorado State one is a just a general bee field guide. Um, and then the second one, the Xerxes one is the Western Bumblebee guide. Got it, got it. I um, suggest that people just click on those links, bookmark those, and uh, those are, are, are very, um, that looks like some really high, high percentage stuff. Bumblebee, this, this Bumblebee guide. It, isn't it interesting so how an inter, a, a good guide makes you want to, um, makes you, makes you want to go out and explore in 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 nature whatever that is you know, if you get a good guide on spiders you want to go geek out with the spiders you get a good guide on bumblebees it's going to open up some of those doors that's really cool totally. Um, totally you know i'd like to introduce you to uh one of the people in our group uh, who's an avid nature journaler as well as um a uh, a, a very very uh very interested in conservation and science. Um, Ann Chadwick is with Point Blue Conservation Science, um, doing primary bird research around the world. And awesome. um, the uh, would, 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 we're delighted to get the two of you in touch with each other. Um, uh, Ann, uh, what you got for Nina? Wow, wow, wow. I'm blown away. That was, first of all, a great presentation. And I love your artwork and the research that you're doing. And I'm just so curious about your career path and, you know, how how you got here and where you're going. So um, really curious, how long till you get your PhD? And then once we're calling you doctor, where are we going to find you? What will you be doing? Yeah, thank you for the for the for the sweet words. Yeah, I've heard of Point Blue and stuff, so that's awesome to see that you're you're working with them and everything too. Um, yeah, so my career path: I did an undergrad at the University of Toronto in ecology and evolution with a specialist in biodiversity and conservation. Um, and then afterwards, I was a lab manager for a couple of years, um, just taking a pause before graduate school. And then I started my PhD after um, a two year break. Um, often some people do masters before if they want kind of a shorter, um, time commitment thing of like one or two years. And that's much more common as well in Europe, but in the U S and biology, at least it's becoming common to just go right into the PhD. And I've, I've known that I wanted to do research for a long time and be paid to study bugs in some capacity. I don't, don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know when, you know, but that's, that's what I'm gunning for. And so I am in my fifth year of my PhD. I'm hoping to wrap it up in not too long. I'm gunning for December or kind of May of next year in that window, trying to finish it up. 
Um, and then I'm trying to get kind of like a short-term postdoc here to stay in the Bay Area um, because I have all these different like local field systems and I try, I'm trying to wrap up some of these projects. So hopefully staying around for another um, a year or two. Um, and then subsequently going to be gunning for some USDA postdoc grants, kind of trying to get my own funding to go do a postdoc, postdoctorate research position somewhere else. And um, the dream for now um, would be kind of Scott McArt's position at Cornell University, where he's half extension, half research, and extension is this branch of agricultural research um, that is talking to the public about um, research that's occurring at university settings and going into community and sharing what research is happening. Master Gardeners Club, for example, is part of that. And so I'm just, I love science communication. I love talking to the public. So I would love for if that was like paid position within my job description rather than just like an additional thing that I'm doing. Um, but if not that, then even being like a professor at like a liberal arts college where I'm in like token entomologist or um, somewhere that's, you know, has master's students or something like that. I think that's, I want to continue going down the academic track for as long as I can um, with the flexibility to be able to integrate these, this more artistic side of myself and the science communication side of myself so that means probably not like an R1 institution, like a research focused on institution, because those ones are like publish, you know, papers and all this stuff. And I'm like, I want to paint bees, you know, <laughs> like it's a little bit, um, yeah. a little bit against it. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the path for now. I'll be here for another couple of years, I think. And then um, just keep going down this path as long as it'll take me. <laughs> Great. Well, at Point Blue, so it's Point Blue Conservation Science, and we are in Petaluma, so not too far from you. And we are trying to expand our kind of use of bringing together art and science to communicate. And we're commu communicating about adapting to climate change and biodiversity loss. And if there's anything I can do to, to help, you know, I will email you because I'm just fascinated by what you're doing. And so I'd ah, uh, okay. be happy to be in touch with you. And thank you, Jack, for introducing us and for this great session. And yeah, and Avea. Thanks for, I, I love your, um, is that a brain hat you've got going there? Very cerebral, love it. And Jack, have a great summer. We're gonna miss you. Oh, I don't know what you, we're gonna you, do. You, you, you too, Anne. Um, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't it be cool to connect Point Blue Conservation Science with this, um, with the, the sort of research that Nina is, is doing? Yeah. With, there, there's there's a sort of intersection of public understanding of science, sort of the things that kind of human interactions with nature, nature interactions with humans, um, and the insects are such a critical and overlooked part of what the story is. I think this is really high percentage stuff. I'm really delighted that uh, you're going to be reaching out and connecting more with with Nina. And please let us know what comes of that. Yeah. Please, yeah, I'm so so excited to to learn more from you. Great, thank you. Excellent. Um, so, you know, I've got a question for you. What was it like to be kind of in this field, looking at um, at, at at outbreaks of of viral outbreaks, and then in the middle of your researching of this, have COVID descend on it from what was there a different perspective that you had from the seat that you had and would just love any insights that you had sort of on a sort of bigger picture um, as we went into that? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely why I mean, my lab, it was even some people study human diseases in my lab. And so they were responsible for making some of the mathematical models to understand when to like, test students to like most safely open up Berkeley and everything. Um, and so I, to some extent felt because I was like in a disease evolution lab at Berkeley, that I was like kind of responsible for synthesizing some of the chaotic knowledge that was coming out initially, but boy, I'm like, this is why I don't study human diseases. I'm like, this is too, I'm like, even the bees, it makes me sad, you know, to, to study yeah. them because of, because of the suffering that can be associated with it. And so I definitely felt like I was like really in the literature for a while, but then I was like, whoa, you know, like I, this is why I don't study human diseases. I'm like, this is, this is, this is hard and sad. And there's, there was so much, I mean, people got to see the real raw experience of the chaos that is the scientific 
uh, endeavor in real time. And I think that that was very um, surprising for people, but I'm like, yeah, this is what we have to like swim through when there's like a new thing popping up and all these like things pulling you in different directions and everything. So it was definitely strange. Um, I would now like to introduce you to another person in our community who is uh, known for spelunking in rabbit holes um, and is um, very uh, intro interested in um, lepidopterans um, over on the, the, the East Coast, um, is a mathematician by training and a very, very curious person. Uh, really interesting, uh, rich journal pages and thinking. Um, this is uh, Susan Beckhart. Susan, thank you for being with us. Hi, well, thank you. This this was really fantastic. It's so exciting. Yes, I, I was I was actually was was amused. I was just just talking about um, at the the local preserve that I've been getting involved with some volunteer work with, uh, which is a very unique and special habitat. And there's a woman who works there who's the entomologist there who is a specialist in bees, although. She does a lot of work with all the different insects that are there. Um, and so I'm just was thinking how she'd, she'd led us on this on this guided walk and went one time last year to uh, go see all the different bees. And I noticed her plucking a bee out of the air. And I thought, she's some kind of like, like bee goddess that the bees just obey. So, but apparently this is a skill that is shared by, by you. So I'm very impressed. My party trick, yeah. I guess that, um, yeah. that's impressive. Yeah, that's cool. Really hits with the right crowd, yeah. 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 Especially yeah. that that whole no, bringing home a baby it. bumblebee song. You know, we know oh, that yeah. that can go wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although I guess a larval bumblebee wouldn't be a problem. Um, yeah, it probably wouldn't sting you. <laughs> but yeah, well, I, so I want I wanted to ask uh, you know, to, if you could say anything more about you know without getting too esoteric, but. Uh, as Jack said, I'm, I'm a mathematician, so I always get interested in these things. But, but like, what do you do work with the mathematical models for how these diseases spread? And especially what I'm curious about is, is like, to what extent do those models like even even predict the, the reality that you see? Or, or are there ways in which those models just don't even come close? Because it feels like there's, these, these things can get very, very complex and have a lot of variables. But it must be very, very difficult to account for all the different things that can be predicted. I'm trying to like wrangle my brain. So my lab is like my PI specializes in mathematical modeling of these things on the status with bee stuff. Is that like honeybee disease dynamics, like thinking within the hive transmission, like that's been really figured out, but there's like three <laughs> papers on like between species transmission of stuff it is absolutely in its infancy mostly because we just um don't have a lot of the data and that's why in part like i'm not a mathematician in training but now i know how to talk to my mathematician friends and <laughs> can um, one day hopefully do this where um for epidemiological models, like the they're like classic, like susceptible, infected, recovered SIR equations that people use for um, modeling epidemics and human diseases, um, we want to, the goal would be to apply that to bee systems and then to try and test different, man it's not even like we'll predict where an epidemic would happen, more so like can we test different management strategies in math rather than like in the field? So for mine, I thought it would be really cool if we could parameterize these models to see if we could help control diseases by like moving honeybees out of a system to see if there are honeybee viruses that they're giving them. Can that help like clear the pathogens out of their system or does it like bonk around in them no matter what? Like it's like the damage is quote unquote the damage is done or can that be a control sort of um, measurement. So I feel like the way that mathematical models will go is more so of testing management. Um, but first, we need to parameterize these models by providing data, things like transmission rate between these things is like, yeah, we, we can put numbers and play around like mathematicians will just be like, let's put it at 0. 0.5 and let's see what happens. Let's put it at 0. 0.2 and see what happens. So that's, you know, where, that's actual, like where we're at. The actual numbers, because that, that's the thing with some of these models is like, sometimes that there, there's some like very, very specific tipping point where if it's, yep. if it's at like 2.3, it's fine mm -hmm. if it's 2.4 oh, now every now everything blows yep. up you know or whatever and you yep. have to figure out where those things are it's, and it's so sensitive yep. to some of those things 
Yeah, that, that's good. And I will say, I'm, I'm a mathematician, but not a statistician by training. So sometimes the, the statistics folks, they, they get way more esoteric than I understand. But uh, yeah, well, I uh, understand I, everything that you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But th th this is really, it's really interesting. When you think about what you are doing as a PhD student and as a researcher, what you are doing is you are creating new knowledge, which is mm -hmm. so, I mean, which of course you can do without people from PhD as well. But like, like, it's sort of amazing to think that like, you know, we can learn things from reading papers and reading books and seeing the things that people have already studied. And then you can learn from that. But when you're out in the field, you're doing this, you are actually like producing new knowledge that literally nobody else has ever figured out before. And it seems like biology especially is so, so ripe for that because we just, we know nothing about what these insects are doing. We, we know nothing, nothing. like nothing. literally nothing, like effectively you nothing. At, you can find questions that like nobody has even asked before or nobody's really had an answer before. It's amazing. Totally. <laughs> so cool. New species of insects, new, new interactions, new viruses, new dynamics. Every system is, yeah, they're, what I like about ecology is that like, there's no competition between like me and my lab mates. Cause I'm like, there's like no way that we could be stepping on each other's toes at this point. Like there's so many many things going on in comparison to like the molecular biology world where they're like looking for like one pathway and so they're like competing with one another like I'm not I don't I'm not about that I'm like no I'm just gonna be in this system and I'm gonna like stare at it for an extended period of time and yeah the discovery part of it is like what keeps me going I'm it's 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 an amazing component of it for sure and I feel so lucky to to be a part of it well, that's, that's, that's awesome. Your, your work. Yeah, when we that that whole humility before the face of the, the the mystery piece of this is also just evident. You know, like for for if you're studying birds, we've got most of the birds identified, right, and named. We're kind of haggling about you know where where it goes for, and we can kind of keep track now with eBird about what's happening with populations. Um, we have these tiny little windows of what is happening with insects and we don't even have you know just a, a, a fraction of the insects that can be uh, identified identified and when we do that we just sort of have this somewhere in a lab there's a bug on a pin and we have no idea what it eats what its reproductive relationships are how it interacts with its viral environment how it interacts with other species um and i i, I it, it's just i think i think that this is, is is also just kind of fun from the perspective of how do we figure things out and and also just sort of seeing how much really 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 important stuff and i put the stuff that you're doing in the really really important stuff category um is it, it's it's a huge question mark. This it's 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 this is beautiful, and I'm just delighted that you are owning this space. And it's also really exciting to me to see the degree that you step into the space of a science communicator and sharing this information with other people. We really really need more of that in the science community to train ourselves how to communicate with people. How can I speak so that people will listen? And to help people be able to, to help people make decisions that are based on evidence. And sometimes, you know, not full evidence, you know, we, we can never get to the, we, because we're not doing, um, let's say, say geometry, we can't do a proof. Yeah. But we can kind of get to the point where this is is there's there's enough information here that this is actionable totally totally yeah i'm that's so it's the best, best we can do with the information that we got and i'm like i i absolutely think that as scientists it's our responsibilities to interact with the communities that we are a part of generally and that we're working with um, and for so long, it's been this like ivory tower, like arcane knowledge, you know, used to only be spoken in Latin sort of thing. And I just think that that needs to be just demolished. You know, I think that we're just community members and we need to be, people don't have the time to be like reading about bees for five straight years. Like I do, but I can like synthesize all of that and like do the work to disseminate that, like in these, these spaces and 
And I just feel really lucky, like I said, that people care so much about bees um, and are willing to listen to me rant about them for like an hour plus. Um, so that's, I just feel very fortunate for, for, for that um, as well. And I think it's generally scientists' responsibilities to do that. Mm -hmm. I think also a nice thing, like, like you were saying about the, the bees being kind of the kind of the giant pandas of the index world. That people people care about them, they like them, um, and, and I, I would think I would say you know like, like like they're big enough to be noticed, and even if some people might be kind of kind of scared of them, you know, stinging at least like you know we've kind of learned we have kind of cultural tendency to appreciate them because they, we we basically know we learn in school that they help us make our food and things. And I think it's it's good to have this kind of ambassador species to get people to yeah. care about protecting them because most people aren't aren't going to have the patience or, or or care about like all these complex interactions and the other like I mean you know somebody out there is probably worried about the mites on the bees and whether those might go extinct or something like that you know people aren't going to care about that but by doing the conservation work to help to take care of these species that is also helping take care of the environments they live in and the ecosystems and all those things i, I was, was, thinking, was was talking to somebody recently um who was complaining about how they had planted lupines in a certain area near her property and which therefore are going to encourage this this particular very rare butterfly that lives in these in this preserve in the, um, that that's very tiny and that feeds on the lupines and uh, because it's endangered, therefore now there's some laws that she can't like develop on that. And she was she was kind of annoyed. She says, "Well, you know, like I could I could use that. I could graze my animals on there, you know. And and if if this butterfly like can't survive in this environment, maybe it just needs to evolve, evolve or go extinct. And you know, and, and it's like, you know, I get it. Like we have lots of blue butterflies. You know, like if if that one species is more dependent on that one species of flower than everything else." And it, and it dies like you know like that's we're not going to lose a whole lot but we don't know what we're going to lose and also and so what i what i said to her in that case was that, like that you know yes the butterfly is kind of the face of this but it's really the ecosystem we're trying to protect and totally. it's a huge huge amount of diversity that is that is in this particular area is not in other parts of new york in this area because it has this unique ecosystem that, that that the more we can protect it, that you know, the more diverse we're gonna get. So I don't know if she listened, but I think yeah, like like Jack said, I think the, the communicating is really good and kind of having finding parts of this for people to really care about that then can, can lead them into caring about the rest of it. I think is totally. I totally agree that there's these umbrella species that can help the the ecosystem around them and. As I always think of bees as a gateway bug because like that that's what gets people into them, especially even the honeybees, even though they're like a not native livestock organism that gets people introduced to native bees in the first place. So massive gateway bug. I think that there's a lot of work to be done. People are excited and do like bees and the connection to them and our food systems is so critical um, because it is a social justice perspective. Like we got to be maintaining our pollinators in order to be maintaining our food systems, you know, because if we lose pollinators and food gets more expensive, who does that negatively impact first as people from more marginalized backgrounds, right? And so I think that there's lots of work that can be done in the conservation space. Yeah, it's all very interconnected. And, and generally this, this idea of this like push and pull between like conservation of like a butterfly and then like grazing of a mammal, this like conservation livestock um tension i am pretty much of the mindset that like those are currently at tension but they don't like have to be um and especially like we can look to indigenous communities and seeing how they were stewarding land as part of their food systems as well like it doesn't have to be like we made this industrial agricultural system that has facilitated a whole bunch of um habitat fragmentation and probably extinction you know because we just wanted mass monocultures even though that's not how nature works at all there's no just like one species that like you know that we grow in one spot and nothing bad happens it's um we've created a system that is wholeheartedly dependent on externalities whether or not that be through fertilizers and you know nitrogen or pesticides or pollination in the case of bees um but if we go towards more integrated um, pest management towards more um sustainable agriculture towards more polycultures and everything that can be it can help the whole thing because one of the major that's climate change but it's also habitat fragmentation and what is most of the land on earth it's devoted to agriculture and so that can be a space in which we're actually stewarding land to be able to facilitate having as much of these species persist into the future because there is redundancy in insects there's so many millions of species like so there is like room to lose. And I think that insects will outlive us by a lot. 
but they are helping us a lot. And so like, we can't just like willy nilly be like, no, oh, we don't need that one. And I'm like, we have no idea. If you lose this node in the network, that can cause a whole reshuffling that we have no ability to predict. So I'm like, we got to, you know, things deserve to live and we've got to, we can have the capacity to steward things both for healthy ecosystems, but also for um, ourselves, you know, and surviving into the future. That is profoundly wise. That is, um, hey, would you ever be interested in meeting up with a nature journal group in the Bay Area to spend a day in the field uh, uh, geeking out and playing with bees? I, I, I can't think of a better day. <laughs> you know, that sounds amazing. Um, I, I think we should make that happen. And apologies to people who are not right in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and you're going to be in the Sierra this summer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, wheels are turning. This, this will be interesting. Um, so um, this is, what you're doing is important. What you're doing is beautiful. Um, we see the interaction, the, the intersection between um, how we figure things out, um, uh, learning stuff, applying that. We get kind of a reflection here of how much we don't know. We get a reflection here of how we can start to figure things out. Um, we're looking at you as a scientist and as an artist. Um, you're, you're an amazing intersection of all of these ideas that are really, really important and dear to us. Um, we're so grateful that you came on to play with us today. Um, I'm so grateful. Um, thank you for all the compliments. I'm just blushing. It was so no, nice. So no, kind. No, no, no. This, 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 is, this is brilliant. This is brilliant, timely, and really, really important. Um, and what you're saying about kind of the implications for us as as a species is uh, is is also it shows so it shows some real deep wisdom um uh i'm going to bring uh, aveo can i bring you back on i'm going to bring back in the um the the mad botanist here um and um was that a kitty cat oh meow uh uh cat zoom bomb uh, we, we get a lot of those in <laughs> in this group um so uh, on behalf of the nature journaling community we're really grateful for you taking your time with us today and and thank you so very much um uh let's jump over to our uh, let's see here um to our gallery view um, I'm going to encourage people to uh, put your screens on and let's show um, uh, some love, mad support, um, and 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 appreciation here. We are we're, thank you so much for for spending this time with us, and um, I think that we will be picking your brain again uh, in the future. Really glad you're also going to be connecting with Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, to see what the intersections are there. For folks in this community uh, who've been watching this, uh, let's use this as just another example of the intersection between art, between science, and being a human being, and um, how we can bring all those pieces together in our worlds, in our lives. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon.